one, two, one, two, three. I want to tell you about a story, a story of the Harper Valley PTA. I don't know if you remember that song and the movie from several years ago, kind of illustrating local government, city corruption, and some of those kind of things, pretty rampant in America. I don't think any town is immune from all that kind of stuff. We have a little bit of that to include in tonight's video. I know this is an AQP channel, aviation, general aviation. But we got to make it entertaining, and I appreciate you guys clicking on this video just because of the thumb. Seriously, you clicked on this video because of the thumb? Look at the views off this thing. Just goes to prove my point, and I think FAA should hire me to be their chief marketing guy. Here's my FISDO poster that I made for them right here. And here's my banjo song. It's September 15th, 2024. Probable cause, Dan Greider. Glad to have you with us. It's Sunday night. Glad to have you with us in the live chat room. Another production here. I'm going to try to cut to the chase and get this done as quickly and efficiently as possible. But we do have a little bit of catch up to do, a little bit of drama to do, a little bit of stuff. I'm going to get you kind of caught up on stuff here. I'm feeling good. My voice is good. My voice is getting better. I appreciate I think I went through a little bit of a drug thing after the accident because of all the narcotics for the pain medication. I've been totally off of all that stuff for such a long time now. I've been on uh, honey therapy for my throat here to try to get a little bit of throat therapy going back again. Maybe it's working. I don't know. Probably be better if my throat totally did not work and I was never able to speak again. A lot of you would be very, very happy about that. My leg is fine. My next visit is October 10th for another x-ray. So far, I'm still on crutches and still in a wheelchair, which is fine. I'm in no pain. Everything's good. I got plenty to do. I got two big, big projects that I'm working on. One of them for sure. Well, actually three. If you include D.B. Cooper Part 3, uh, that's another big project, but that's a little ways off. I got another big video project that I am working on. I think it's going to come out probably in the next two weeks, and you're not going to believe that. This is a national story. You're all familiar with it. You've all heard the story. I'm going to give you my take on that story. I'm not going to tell you what the story is. And then I got a third one that I've kind of taken a deep dive into in the last 30 days, which I find fascinating. I'm probably not ever going to publish that one unless it becomes necessary, but I think I'm going to hold on to that and do that. So I'm going to get uh, I'm gonna get you kind of caught up on a couple things here. First of all, my local Griffin, Georgia toxic water story. We were successful. We filed the paperwork. We did the complaint. We forced the city of Griffin to do an assessment with Georgia Department of Transportation to figure out how many hangars were being illegally used. The answer was most of them. GDOT came down uh, and sided with FAA and said that the airport had to either do something or close it down or something. So they forced their hand. The problem with Griffin and Spalding County is they don't have the money to kick in for the new airport. This entire move the airport project that they've had on the table has been going since 2006. Every time it comes time for the county and city to kick in their part of the money, there's the problem. They can't support it with a tax referendum. But now, at this point, because of my efforts and the data that I showed and the survey that was completed via GDOT, they have forced their hand. Either pay the money back, uh, the grants and assurances money, or gather the money and move the airport. And now they're saying that this new airport is going to be open by the year 2029. I doubt it, but we'll see. At least I got a ruling on this thing. All the illegal uses of those hangars and the toxic water problem down there is legit. Um, they they got their hand forced on this. They're going to have to move this airport. They're going to either have to pay it back or move it. So far, they have chosen to spend the money and move it, and I'm uh, very happy for that. I appreciate all your support on toxic water. I've been kind of silent on it for a little while while I got the paperwork and got the results and got some actual substantial data to show that. Uh, but we're all good. If you Google it in the newspaper, you'll see that uh, the airport is now moving forward towards moving the airport, in which case it's going to make our current hangar location at Griffin, Georgia, an industrial park. And that's how they're going to solve that problem. Let's go on. I want to talk about Charles Cook. I haven't talked about Charles Cook and that whole thing. But uh, let me give you a very quick, brief update. Um, a $1.2 million default judgment is ridiculous. I appealed that on the basis of eight different ways. I'm going to file that appeal brief in my 
uh, AQP and Coffee page. There's a Facebook page called AQP and Coffee. I don't manage it or own it, but I have the capability to uh, file a document there. It's a PDF. I'm going to show you the PDF, and it's going to be stored on AQP and Coffee. You have to become a member or join AQP and Coffee, and then you'll have access to that PDF. But that's the that's the brief that we filed concerning this judgment. So here's the story. The default judgment was given $1.2 million for defamation against Dan Greider as an individual. I hired an attorney firm. They did an excellent job. They filed what we call an appeal brief. That got filed in May. The opposing counsel had time to file a reply brief and argue in writing what was in that brief. After that, our side, our firm, had a chance to give a reply to the reply. So there's now three PDFs in here. I'm going to show you just a little bit of um, documentation from the second one. This is their reply brief to our brief. And here's what it says. Expert Chris Smith's expert report was admitted into evidence showing reasonable damages of $152,000 plus an additional $18,000 in cost to undertake an advertising campaign to repair a palace reputation. Now, that's money that they say that they spent to repair Charles Cook's reputation. How do you spend $200,000 to repair a reputation? Like, what did you do? Take out TV ads or, or what? I don't know how you spend money to repair a reputation. Let's go on and read the rest of this thing. It says, uh, this guy, this uh, Michael Edward Savage, William Michael Edward Savage, a former member of the FedEx Pilots Union and an accident investigator, testified that appellant Appellant's defamatory statements foreclosed Mr. Cook's ability to retire from being a pilot and serving on the FedEx Accident Investigation Board. So me publishing one video when I had 14,000 subscribers foreclosed his ability to retire and kicked him off the Accident S Investigation Board for an accident at his airport, which he claims he wasn't even at. Like, how is that possible? Let's read on here. Mr. Cook testified... Mr. Uh, finally, Mr. Cook testified that appellant's defamatory statements resulted in a loss of hangar tenants, business opportunities, and profits, as well as damaged his and the airport's reputation and his career opportunities with FedEx. Well, let's talk about his career opportunities at FedEx. He's at the end of his career with FedEx. You don't really have a career opportunity at the very, very end. And I'm going to show you the timeline here in just a second on what this thing happened here. Mr. Cook also testified that he spent at least $12,000 trying to repair the appellee's reputation by providing lunch on Saturdays for airport tenants and local aviation community members. You're going to spend $12,000 to buy lunch for people so that they'll like you? I'm I'm not understanding that, but I'm just saying here's the document. Uh, this is First Amendment free speech. I don't understand. Let's go on and take a look at this next document here. I'm going to show you Mr. Cook's medical. Here it is. Doesn't look like anything special here, except if you notice the date of his last medical was March of 2021. So now I'm going to show you the timeline here. In red, in March of 2021, Mr. Cook does his last first-class medical, and it's only good for six months. In August of 2021, this is when the Cook's fatal plane crash killed the two. In August of 2021, Charles Cook's First class medical expires. It's only good for six months. Now in July, in their reply brief, July of 2024, Charles Cook claims loss of FedEx career in July of 2024 for an accident. He hasn't had a medical. He can't get a medical. If he could get a medical of any kind, he would. I have a sneaking suspicion why there is no medical here, but you can't get a medical under certain conditions. This is true for any pilot in America. You have to have certain conditions met to get any class medical. The fact that there's been no medical since March of 2021 is a, a huge clue here. Let's go on and take a look at the next one here. I'm going to put it on the screen here for you. This specifically says... Appelli, Appelli agrees with Appellant regarding the fact that Appellees have burden of proving actual damages. Now, this is their side writing this. So I find this shocking. They're saying that they agree with me regarding the fact that Appellees have the burden of proving actual damages. Well, you got to have actual damages. Let's go to the bottom of this. Even so, evidence of loss of reputation should be more than theoretical. you got to have something on paper. You can't just have somebody testified that they think you lost a lot of money. You got to have accounting, QuickBooks, documentation. You have to have, to have a CPA statement and show uh, a five-year loss in, in something. They had none of that. They have testimony from people who said that they think he lost money. Well, how much money? How much is damage to your reputation? Remember, in a civil case for defamation, there is no 
punitive damages. You have to have actual damages, and they agreed with me. Appellee agrees with appellant regarding the fact that appellees have the burden of proving actual damages. Here's the last one I'm going to show you here. This says, first, comparing the facts uh, with those present in the case shows the appellees are not limited purpose figures. Here, unlike the plaintiff, in WFFA TV in court, the record shows that Mr. Cook was not present at the scene of the incident. He maintains that he was not present at the scene of the incident. However, I think he was, and we're about to find out. And who was the first to reach the wreckage after the plane crashed in that driveway? And they're both dead hanging in that airplane. Who was the first one there to hop the fence and run across? Who was the first one there? All right, so on the day that this thing happened, this guy here is the guy that came over here first, you think? Ran across the street? I think so, yeah. Okay. All right, yeah, that's uh, that's Charles Cook. He's he's the owner of the airport. So uh, how many people came over here with him then? Oh, uh, I think three. Three? Okay, good. Yeah, that's what you told me before. And then uh, how long was it until, like, ambulances and stuff got here? Like a long time after? Yeah, it was like 20, 30 minutes. Really? Yeah. A long time. Right, but uh, but those first three guys were the first one, first ones here. Yeah. Okay. Before the ambulance got here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much. I appreciate your help. All right. Bye bye. Bye. I'm gonna go on to a new topic about a new airport. I'm not gonna say where it is or who the commissioners are or who the airport board is or who the airport manager is. This is another airport someplace in America. However, the airport manager is very young female that knows nothing about airplanes is not a pilot and here's her listing here's her bio explaining that she is the person that uh, clears airplanes to take off and land she controls air traffic at her airport i had a phone call with this individual concerning the subject that i'm about to tell you about you would not believe what she said in this phone call and i'm going to play it at a future date but not today here's the problem this airport has a tenant who is an A&P and an IA, does general aviation maintenance, an excellent guy, does excellent work on general aviation airplanes. He has a hangar, and he has been there for a long time. Um, the airport allowed somebody to build a 100 by 100 hangar just three feet to the side of him. However, that person did not get a permit. They didn't do a site survey. They didn't do an elevation. They didn't do any studies. They didn't get any of the proper approval from the airport. They just scratched out a pad, poured concrete, and put this hangar up. After the fact, the city and the county gave him a certificate of occupancy, although he had not followed any rules. All oh, that's well and good. So what? The main problem now is that when it rains, the water flows downhill and flows directly into this other guy's hangar, and he has had to live with this water problem. City, county, and airport will not do anything about it, even though they're fully conscious of it. I'm going to show you a video of this right now. This is water four inches deep in his hangar every time it rains. How would you like to work on airplanes with four-inch water on your hangar floor every time it rains? It's all because the city allowed this hangar to be built. It was not proper at the time. City and county and this airport need to take some culpability for this entire thing. These airport commissioners, there's three of them. I'll show you their pictures. One, two, and three. This is Harper Valley PTA, and there is some funny, there's some funny business going on here. I don't want to do a story on this. I think that they should get together and get a backhoe out there and fix this drainage problem so that this doesn't exist. Here's a video from the meeting just recently that they had at this airport where they completely admit this is the problem. It's their problem. And and here it is right here. I'll just show it to you. We'll find out for sure they're going to investigate. If we get funding for it. What goes in in November? So I get to get flooded until you get money for what you've done to me? That's what it sounds like right now. Yes. I get to get flooded until you get money for what you've done to me? That's what it sounds like right now. Yes. I get to get flooded until you get money for what you've done to me? That's what it sounds like right now. Yes. So it's another Harper Valley PTA situation. I plan on spending a lot of time. I'm going to go up there and go to meetings. I'm going to shoot video. 
what they don't want. This airport board and these commissioners don't want their picture on TV. They don't want any hoopla. They don't want any more attention to the wrongdoings that are currently going on in their county. The, the commissioners are elected officials. They don't want that. I'll offer them a deal. Just fix the water problem, and I think this will be totally good. That's not a threat or a blackmail. I'm just saying it's a story. If there's no story, there's nothing I can do about it. If there is a story and the water continues to run in this hangar, I think I'm going to go up there and film water coming in the hangar, and I'm probably going to play a few pictures of some of the other associated things associated with this airport that I have found that I think are absolutely astounding. I don't think they want that stuff out there. I think you ought to get a backhoe out there and just fix the problem, Mr. Commissioners, and that would be very, very easy. I've got other things to spend my time on. However, I will get riled up over this one. This is a mechanic and an AMP who's trying to do a service for our general aviation community, and you guys are asleep at the wheel. Let's go on and talk about the next one. Uh, back to general aviation. You know, I got informed last week about an FAA wing seminar concerning the impossible turn. I can't believe it. FAA is going to endorse an impossible turn. Not only that, they're endorsing a for-profit company selling an app so that pilots can look down at their iPads during takeoff or their iPhones during takeoff for guidance on whether to turn around and specifically how to turn around. Here's the video from it. Turn back possible. I find this incredible. This is this is an airplane at a 45 degree bank at 200 feet following iPhone guidance on encouraging people to turn around. FAA, you got to be kidding me. How many people have we killed? This is this is the annual Dick McSpadden award trying to turn around. It doesn't work. Look at the amount of space straight ahead. You have an engine failure, go straight ahead, land the land the airplane, open the door, and call me. It's easy. Trying to turn around to the airport for what? Let's look at the very end of this video. Let's look at how steeply he's banked over the runway. Now he's landing in the last 1,000 feet of this runway. FAA, I don't get it. The other thing I don't get is this thing called teardropping to the downwind. We've had a lot of attention on it. Uh, my friend Jeff Simon just did a little podcast with my other friend Jason. I can't think of his last name. Jason, the CFI guy from California. They're on here. And listen to Jeff. He's talking about the amount of chatter that um, has to do with this teardrop to downwind. Well, what's happened is that Foreflight has drawn a magenta line on iPads for these young students, showing them how to enter the downwind pattern when flying overhead and entering the pattern. They want you doing a right, a right descending turn into a left downwind. Well... If you do the math, that just simply puts you into descending head-on turn with the other traffic. Remember, other traffic can be flying as far as a two-mile final. You could have a G5, a Gulfstream G5, on a two-mile wide down downwind at your same altitude, descending out of 1,500 on the downwind. You could be doing a descending turn. The traffic pattern is a circular flow around the air airport. You cannot turn right in the vicinity of an airport in this four-flight traffic pattern. Jason tells you exactly where it came from. It came from four-flight. I think there's a limited, a limited amount of a liability implied here on this thing. I don't think you should do it. Um, uh, Brian Schiff says don't do it. Jason says don't do it. Uh, Jeff Simon says don't do it. FAA, I'm not exactly sure why we're not talking about this a little bit more. A left downwind is a left-hand downwind. All turns should be made to the left, one in the vicinity of the traffic pattern at any non-controlled airport. Talk it up, talk to the other airplane, work it out. Left turns only, land the airplane, stay straight, and don't do any of this four-flight right teardropping to the left downwind. It's, it's ridiculous. I want to dive in into at least one real uh, kind of like hot topic, and it seems yeah. like right now... There are a few things blowing up the internet when it comes to general aviation more than pattern entries. That's this is this is the thing of the day that oh is is kind of blowing everything up. And uh, one of the topics, my good friend Brian Schiff has also been talking about it. You've been talking about it. Everyone's going crazy about it. Um, tell me about kind of what's going on with pattern entries and this thing that people are debating about teardrop entries. It's just it's and why on <laughs> earth. Is this is the hot thing. Um, I think the short answer to that question is probably four flight, to be honest. 
I'm going to show you some NTSB data while I'm talking here. I'll show you the deal. This is off the NTSB site. I just picked out this random thing. In the last three years, guess how many aviation accidents, general aviation accidents, the NTSB has been involved in? Well, here's your answer right here. 3,241 accidents that they have investigated and uh, and worked on and got a docket and done all this stuff. 3,241. This is just in the last three years, ending up at the last day of December 2023. How many recommendations? Out of 3,241 accidents that they've spent money to investigate, how many recommendations? One. Only one. They're not telling us what to do. We're not fixing anything. They're hoarding the data. We don't get any better. The one recommendation that they did do, pretty up uh, beat up the FAA pretty badly. This is the Marfat Huey, November 9, 8 Foxtrot that killed all the people up in West Virginia just a few years ago. Turns out your FISDO had no idea these. this helicopter operation was completely illegal. They were selling rides. They were, they were doing training. They were doing everything. They didn't have an operating certificate. They had no letter of authorization. They did not have a ride exemption. They didn't have any of that stuff right under the watchful eye of the local FISDO. And here's your recommendation from NTSB about the FAA. The FAA was asleep at the wheel, had no idea that this was even going on. This helicopter, bad maintenance, it lost an engine, it crashed onto the highway. Everybody dead, horrible crash. And out of 3,241 incidents, this is the only recommendations we've seen in the last three years. It's totally amazing. NTSB, what are we spending our money on? I think they were spending our money on investigating Dan's Lockheed crash. I finally got my GoPro back. Here it is right here. Thank you, NTSB. And I want to also mention, I'm going to do a little bit of video on this a little bit further on, but the tailwheel, locked or unlocked, makes no difference to me or Glenn. I prefer on grass to have the tailwheel unlocked. I did not know what the position was. We did our before takeoff checklist. We were very careful. I videotaped it. We were very careful to as assume that all the killer items are complete and verify those. Tailwheel locked or unlocked. And I want to make this very, very important point. If the tailwheel had been locked and we had touched left brake and had no right brake, we still would have gone off the runway. Tailwheel being locked, it's a tiny little tailwheel in a 12,000 pound airplane. It is not going to keep you on the runway. Tailwheel being locked will not keep you straight. Would not have done anything except make our veer to the left slightly less angle, which would have put us into a fuel farm. With the tailwheel unlocked, if it was, I think it probably was, with the tailwheel unlocked, we went left towards the bushes and happened to dead center a tree. I'm glad that it was unlocked because if it had been locked, I think we would hit that fuel tank and we'd for sure all be dead right now. Tailwheel locked or unlocked on the Lockheed or Beach 18 on grass makes no difference. I've flown both of these. I used to own a Beach 18. I prefer on grass tailwheel unlocked for sure. I have much more control and I don't want that thing binding or getting in my way. I have brakes and I have rudder. That's how I control where the tailwheel goes. I'm in the pilot command. I'm going to make that tailwheel go where I want it to go. I don't want a tailwheel locked on grass. Long straight taxi on pavement, maybe. It's a nice feature, kind of like autopilot during taxi. It helps you keep it straight a little bit. But for the rest of the time, I am not a fan. Remember, we are going to Tenerife. Uh, November 5 through 8, I'm leaving out of Newark, New Jersey, on United, nonstop over to Tenerife. It's about a, a seven-hour flight getting in the morning of the 6th. We'll be in, on the ground over there all day 6, all day 7, leaving back out. At least I'm leaving back out on the morning of the 8th, nonstop back to Newark. If you'd like to go on that flight, you're welcome to it. Very inexpensive flight. It's wide open. If you want a non-rev or jump seat or use pass privileges, the flight is wide open. We're staying at the Marriott in Tenerife. I've got this group chain mail, uh, letter thing going here. Got quite a few people going. I think it should be an interesting trip. It's an investigation trip. We're trying to go to the spot, see where this happened, and gain as much information as we can. I'm going to shoot a little bit of video. This is one location I've just always wanted to go to. I'm not sure what the purpose is or if we'll learn anything earth-shaking or not. Maybe, maybe not, but you never know until you go. This is the world's worst aviation accident. This is the one where two 747s ran together. March 27th of 1977, I remember it well. I was in high school. I remember the accident. It was the front page of every newspaper. Horrible crash. I can't remember. More than 500. Seems like it was 560 people died instantly 
on that crash. Two 747s hit. It's not unlike some of the things that are going on in America and uh, around the world in aviation today and commercial 121. So many close calls once a week, another close call. It's only a matter of time, in my opinion, till we have another Tenerife in America, either a midair in the sky or a collision on the ground or two airplanes get together. It's happening all the time. I don't know if you follow Vass Aviation. He posts most of those. I don't even have time to follow all of them now. It happens so often. It's This is 121 carriers. This is your commercial airlines having very near close calls. It's almost always controller error. Almost always controller error, and there is no brasher for the controllers. Nothing's going to get fixed. They're hiring who they need to hire based on race, sex, color, and sexual orientation. That's what they're doing, and I think that's what we're going to see. I, I brace for impact because, in my opinion, it's only a matter of time. In order for this industry to prosper and to continue to prosper and to go the way it's going, we have to create more opportunities for diversity and allowing more people in. I'm going to try an experiment tonight after this video. If you're still hanging around, if you're in the live chat, give me a yes if you can. I'm going to put this on the screen. I'm going to do a Zoom, and I'm going to give you the Zoom meeting ID and the passcode if you'd like to join this Zoom. I've never done it before, so I'm not sure how many people can be held in this room because I don't have a commercial Zoom account. It's only good for 40 minutes, I know that, but I want to do this as a test. If you have Zoom and have the chance to, to jump in there, this will enable two-way communication where we can actually talk. I can give you the mic and you can talk. I can We'll put your picture on the screen. This is an informal Zoom. I'm not sure how many people, but uh, here's the meeting ID and the passcode. This, this meeting will commence just a few minutes after tonight's Sunday Night Probable video closes. I appreciate that. I'm hoping I get a few people will jump in there and help me test this concept. If it works good, I think we're going to do a commercial account and do a uh, group AQP meeting every now and then. I would like your opinion. I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to give you the microphone so we can see who you are, uh, where you're calling from, where you're checking in from, what your experience base is, and what your idea is. A lot of you people out there have some really great ideas, and I have absolutely gained so much from listening to people on uh, comments and in the text and all those kind of things concerning these videos and this AQP and my general aviation mission of reducing the general aviation fatal accident rate. I think this is going to be a fun time. There it is on the screen one more time. Zoom, there's the meeting ID, and there's the passcode. I hope to see you there and uh, join us here as soon as this uh, video is over. Um, I, did a, I did my very, very first AQP flight review since... The Lockheed crash, I did it uh, the first of the week, a week ago. A guy named Howard, friend of mine, came down with his A36 Bonanza. Long time uh, Bonanza owner. I made a mistake in the video that I shot with him. I said he's owned that airplane since 1990. Not true. He's owned it since about 2000. Very experienced. Been flying a lot, taking a lot of courses. But this is his second AQP flight review. Even after his second one, Howard learned a lot. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong. I think I think Howard is an absolute classic good pilot, wants to learn. But even after all of this, there's still some classic mistakes that Howard made and some improvements we were able to make compared to his very first AQP general aviation flight review that we did well over a year ago. I did this concluding video with him. It's very, very short, but I want you to listen. Here's me and Howard discussing his AQP flight review. It's my first one since my accident. And yes, I'm legal to instruct. I don't have a medical right now. I'll have a medical back here in the very near future, but because of my leg, I, I don't have a medical, but I can fly. I can instruct without a medical. And that's what the situation was here. Here's my interview, my closing interview with Howard. Down here today with Dr. Howard. It's a doctor with a bonanza. Yeah. You know what that means. <laughs> Doc Howard's in for his second AQP flight review, which we just finished up. It's been a little over a year since we've flown together. Yeah. Just in review, what was your what was your take? We've been in the air and doing ground school kind of off and on all day here today. What was uh, what was some takeaways for you off of what we did here today? Some some things that uh, yeah. maybe needed refreshing that, that we kind of beefed up a little bit. Well, this like anything else requires practice because you know the year more that had been since we first did it together, you know there were the maneuvers uh, or not the maneuvers the procedures that we did that really needed refreshing. In particular, I think uh, the one that I didn't appreciate enough 
is when you totally lose engine power on the climb out of an airport in a bonanza, you've got to get that nose down. And it's a concerted effort to get it down and you have no time to do it because one of the uh, things that we did is I waited two seconds and in two seconds that airspeed was below 80. Oh yeah, it, it went away quick. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So it has to be an immediate reaction, which is the whole point of AQP. Yep. Well, here's what I saw. We we worked on and cleaned up your procedures, your checklist, your power plant start, after start checklist, before taxi checklist, all those procedural things. I beat you up hard on those, gave you suggestions for really ways to bulletproof yourself. Mm -hmm. On takeoff, we talked about RTO. We did a rejected takeoff. And then we did five rotots in a row. That's a reduction of thrust. Mm -hmm. Even knowing about where we're where we're supposed to head to this thing. Mm -hmm. Notice it took three or four to kind of get fine-tuned on how we're gonna handle a rotot, which is a reduction of thrust on takeoff, mm -hmm. where we can't get back to the airport. Right. Then we did a couple up high, we went to 4,500 feet, and mm -hmm. I killed the engine up high. Notice we did a total of four of those, four. Right. and it took several to get energy management planned and figure out how to do that. So it just takes rehearsal. You're a good pilot. You've been flying the Bonanza a long time. You've had this Bonanza since 1990, but notice if you'd been given that situa situation, especially that uh, very first mm -hmm. low tot that I gave you, uh, that we were low to the ground. That that was. Mm -hmm. I wish I had that on video, but that's right. kind of what I see yeah. on those. Uh, the speed goes away so quickly. You really, really have to um, be ready for it to happen even though it may not happen. Yeah. You just gotta assume that it's gonna happen. And you know, the other thing is, you know, the energy management, uh, it takes as much uh, deliberate planning when you're, you're really high as it is when yeah. you wish you had more yeah. altitude. Because the whole idea is you gotta get yourself into the position yeah. so that you can make that routine landing without power. Mm -hmm. And I hope I underscored enough don't be afraid of an off-field landing. Land it, gear up, full flaps someplace. If that's the best shot, if that's your sure shot, take it. You might be able to make it back to the airport, but you might not. If you've got pure gold in front of you, put the flaps down, land the airplane, and call me. Forget it. it it's over. It's, it's not worth attempting with a sick engine to make it all the way back around. No, absolutely. You know, um, it's not, uh, it's ridiculous. You know, the minute that happens, uh, there are two things. Number one, you, you fly the airplane. Number two, you uh, say the airplane now belongs to the insurance company. And number three, I'm going to put this thing down, open the door, and call Dan to buy me dinner. <laughs> I'd love to buy you dinner. I, I yeah. sure would. Yeah. Uh, that would be, that would be, <laughs> that'd be good. But I hope more people will, uh, will hear this and underst yeah. understand. Uh, we, we beat you up hard all day today on all those things. This is a flight review. You get signed off for a flight review, but notice we didn't do a single steep turn. Right. You know yeah. you know how to do a steep turn. Yeah. I'm only giving the things that are definitely going to happen to you out there and fix sure. all that stuff. So I couldn't recommend it a lot. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, it's only been a hobby for me, but I've been doing it for about 50 years. Yeah. Uh, I do fly regularly, but... Um, it's uh, th there's there's no replacement for for doing what we did to keep you really on top of the ball. Yep, and think about those. Uh, even when I'm not in the seat, use your best planning. Be ready for an RTO. Be ready for a rotot. Be ready for a low tot. If you're flying along up high, be ready when that engine starts to balk to do your items. Lower the nose and pick you out someplace that you're going to go. Take the very best th first thing that's very best where it's a guaranteed outcome. That's all you have to do, and we would be totally fine. We can fix your airplane. Right. It's no problem. Or if you can't, you can collect the insurance on it. Yeah. Or if you can, it's just one of those things. Yeah. It's a materialistic thing. It's gone, and you still have your life. Exactly. Well, I appreciate it, Howard. Thank you. Super, I'm, the, I'm the one that appreciates everything no, thanks you for do. coming down, and yeah. uh, sure appreciate you making, making the trek down here, and it was fun flying with you today. Absolutely. Look forward to the next time. All right. There we go. So you can see Howard's very, very open to discussing and talking about this thing. 
we, I beat him up. I mean, I, I gave it to him. Uh, I want him to be totally ready for this thing. That's AQP for General Aviation, your annual flight review. I signed him off. He got not only an instrument competency check, but a flight review signed off. Um, he got all that stuff done. Let's go on to our next topic. There was a little Cherokee 140 uh, up in uh, Illinois, had the engine quit, I believe, on the downwind. They did not make it to the runway, but they did a nice job of not stalling the airplane. It landed on a road, which was about the only place they could put it. They went to the right. The right wing hit something and it ended up in the bushes. Here's a little picture of that. Don't know who it was, but it was a CFI and a student. Congratulations, both of them. Opened the door, stepped out, no injuries. They did not stall their airplane after an engine failure. They landed on a road. Um, Landing on a road is is dangerous, but it was I think it was from that position, it was their only choice. Should they have been a little bit closer and stayed within gliding distance of the runway? Maybe. I can't second guess that. All I can say is this is what happened. It's a Cherokee 140. I'm pretty familiar with that little airplane. Good job to those guys because they're able to live and fly another day. Let's go on and take a look at our September data. I'll put it up on the screen here right now. This is September of 2024. And I've already gone over a little bit, but I want to pay attention to the very, very first one on September 1, November um, 2-3, Bravo Delta. This is a Satabri out in Wyoming, and I just found out this was an ash spreading. The lady in the back seat that died, she was the passenger. She was spreading the ashes of her husband, and that's when this airplane crashed. The next one, 223 Charlie Lehman, that's that Apex David Bauer, 50 years old, the trike. I still don't know very much about trikes or this particular accident. And then the next one, this is the one that happened in Georgia, November 9, 659 Lima. This is the Grumman in Georgia. This was a stall and a spin. The guy's name was Sung, Sung Wook Lee, 27 years old, an Oriental flight instructor who came from Florida, just moved up to Georgia and uh, lost control of the airplane during flight instruction. No further information on that one yet. And now the next one is interesting, 629 Alpha Golf. This is the PA-46, this is the 350P up in Indiana. This is a stall spin during a go-around. Joseph Scallion, 68 years old. Turns out I knew Joseph and didn't realize it when this airplane accident happened. Joseph is one of the guys that invited me to Iowa several years ago to do an AQP conference at his hangar. Here's a picture in his hangar. This is him in the green sweater right here. His wife did not like flying high, and he had to have something pressurized. Joe had about 650 or 700 hours. This airplane may have been a little bit ahead of him. However, they did stop and pick up a CFI. I think Joe had a CFI in the right seat when this thing happened. However, they came in from the north. I'm going to show you the graphic here. They came in from the north. The tower told them to go around because they were hot, which means they're high and fast. They tried to go around. The wreckage ended up to the southeast of the airport. I'll put this graphic on here. And I had a friend of mine fly over the crash site. Here is the crash site as photographed from the air. This is a right crosswind steep pull up and the wing lost lift. This is a crazy critical wing on this airplane. Um, it, it does not hack high G. This is basically an accelerated stall during the go around. I think the gear was up and I think they had full power and nose up and pulled hard and turned to the right. This is a non-stabilized approach. They should have smelled this coming a long ways away. They should have ended up on a five-mile final, stabilized, checklist complete, on the LPV path, gear down, and ready to go. You don't need to come flying in here 30 knots fast, clean, and gears not down, and checklist not complete. I think that they were just high and fast and way, way, way behind the airplane when the tower instructed them to go around because this obviously is not looking good. All right, I'm going to put the screen back up here again. This is the next one. We've already talked about this. This is the Boeing PT-17. It's an engine failure, I believe. Chris Paulson, 72 years old, he did survive. His passenger in the back seat did not make it. And then the PA-28-180 in Connecticut. What a heartbreaking story here. I have no idea. Paul Pal Palladier. Peltier, age 55, went on a Sunday morning to give a ride. Uh, this is a very young high school student interested in aviation. Total of four people in the airplane. They flew to this location for a Sunday brunch. Nobody saw the airplane take off. Nobody saw the accident happen. There's no witnesses or no cameras. They didn't even find the airplane. That airplane didn't even get reported missing till 10 o'clock that night, and they didn't find it till about 1 a.m., it's a stall spin. It hit vertical. No idea why or or what it was, but this is most likely, in my opinion, probably a loss of thrust or some kind of a problem. Highly unlikely that they had any kind of a flight control problem. 
There was no weather. There was there was nothing else going on like that. They did not get gas. They flew up there to that airport. They, they could not have been heavier than what they flew in. Simply a stall or some kind of a problem after takeoff put this airplane vertical into the woods. Took a long time and a drone to find it. Our deepest respects and condolences to that entire family and friends in Connecticut. A horrible loss for four people and the lives and friends associated with that plane crash. So senseless and i can tell you firsthand i have the experience i'll show you the scar i've been in a plane crash it's not fun uh this one probably was painless they probably never felt a thing i think we should take a concerted effort to avoid being in a plane crash i can tell you it's excruciating pain you don't want to be trapped in an airplane hurt and damaged Take preventive measures wherever you can. Do AQP training, conditioning. Are you ready? Are you ready for that engine failure? Are you ready for that rotot? Are you ready to go straight ahead and put it in an open field? Are you ready? I hope that you are. I hope that we learn from some of these tragic fatals that we're seeing. Here's the next one up here on the screen. This is November uh, 966 Delta Pop. This is a Sonics up in Indiana. The guy's name was David Province, 82 years old, on takeoff. Lost control, flipped it over. It ended up upside down. The airplane was not damaged too badly. Here's a picture of it. It wasn't damaged. I think he probably asphyxiated from being upside down too long before they could get to him and get him out. He was 82 years old. I think he probably suffocated from being upside down. Couldn't get him out in time. And uh, here's his obituary. Uh, farmer, uh, longtime Indiana resident, uh, excellent guy. Everybody liked him. A horrible loss on a tragic uh crash scenario up there a simple loss of control on takeoff then the very last one um i'm sorry the second to last one is this bonanza down in louisiana this is a low top greg manual age 73 he takes off from four left at lafayette has his engine failure and he stalls spun this is the exact same scenario i gave to howard so many times and on howard's first one when i gave him his engine failure he pulled he did actually he did not lower the nose in a timely fashion he didn't pull howard didn't pull he just didn't push. You have to consciously really lower that nose in an A36 or that speed is going away. Once it's gone, that thing spins. It hit this airplane down Lafayette, hit on the golf course. It was a fireball. Fortunately, nobody on the ground got hurt at all. Just the loss of one. The guy in uh, Louisiana was a great guy. David Manuel, 73 years old. He was a home builder and uh, a, a loss for the entire community down there. And then the very last one, November 8, Charlie Kilo up in Alaska. This was Danny Presley, 70 years old, had two people on the airplane, another Satario. All they said was that it was flying and weather. There was terrain. It was weather-related, probably fog, low vis, maybe even spitting snow. It's that time of year in Alaska. I know very little about it. I'm sure we'll get more data as time goes on. Another loss of two lives in an aircraft up in Alaska, pushing the limits on weather and terrain and flew this thing into the terrain somehow up there. We know very, very little about it. I'm uh, That's really all I can say about it because I certainly don't know. I'd like to say thank you for those who are supporting the DTSB. I'll put this, we are a 501c3. I'll put this on the screen here right now if you want to send a check. Here's a few people who have sent a check along with a note. I'm probably going to start playing those notes as they come in. Send a check with a note. I'll put it on the screen. If you want your name up there, if you don't, just leave a note that you don't want it on there. Very, very nice. Uh, donations are be coming into the DTSB. We've now got probably seven or $8,000 from the DTSB fund. I'm going to use that to travel. I have that fund available that I can get money from that for travel. That's not obscene expenses. That's recovering money for a hotel or a meal or something that I used to go and speak and do AQP on the road like I have always done. I've just never had any financial support at all. It's still the same. I'm still going to go do it. I'm about ready to uh, relaunch going out to do that. My deal is, is that after I go out there, if I had to spend any money of my own, I can keep the receipts. I can apply for a refund from the board. The board will vote whether or not to authorize a refund based on my receipts, my reasonable receipts for money spent. And that's what the DTSB fund is, is for. Very happy with the board. Matt Evers at Evers CPA in Nashville, Tennessee. The money goes in there. Dan can't touch it. It's all good. And I, I really love the concept. It makes me feel a thousand percent better. 
about going out on the road knowing that I'm going to get compensated and reimbursed for expenses that I had to spend to get a meal or a place to sleep maybe on the road, even though I don't really need a place to sleep very, very often out there. Normally, I got a hangar or a home or a bedroom or somebody something in somebody's house. Uh, so everything is always very economical. If you'd like me to come to speak to your chapter, your club, whatever, uh, send me an email. I am now open to booking some of those things coming up in the future. My leg's going to be okay. I'm going to be okay to travel. I would like to speak at your chapter. Plan a dinner. Plan a Dan evening with the banjo and a dinner. It'll be entertaining. I'd love to come and see you and talk to your pilots, your wives, your girlfriends. Bring them all. Your dogs. Bring bring everybody. Have a, an evening or lunch. You can do a pancake breakfast, whatever event you'd like to do. Send me an email. I'll talk to you about it, and uh, I'm going to try to start doing those. I feel 100% better about doing all those in the very near future. That's it for tonight. Don't forget about our Zoom call that's about to start in a few minutes. Here's the graphic for it. Here's the meeting ID and the passcode. I have no idea how many people I can let in there, but uh, tonight's a trial night. We'll just have some fun with it. I'd love to talk to you on Zoom. If you'd like to support me individually, Dan, at this office, here's my four ways of doing that. That's Zelle, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo. I appreciate your one or two dollars support for these videos. A lot of you have done that and I thank you very, very much. There's a lot of people that uh, every week will Venmo a dollar or two or something like that. It's not a get rich quick thing, but there are always at least 50 people that will, will Venmo or, or Cash App a dollar in, and I appreciate that. That goes towards a lot of my uh, expenses and trouble to make these videos as well. Let's uh, get over there. You can hear the music playing right now. This is the Harper Valley PTA, and I hope you'll appreciate this little guitar thing that I did on this for tonight. I pulled out the guitar and a banjo and made this song. My tiny little itty bitty pleasant YouTube channel, Dan Grider. Problem cause.